Good morning, everybody. Wednesday morning, Seattle Revival Center, camp meeting, awakening and harvest. Wow. Wow. When when, uh, we had our praise and worship meeting on Friday night, Sandy made mention of something that I just want to bring out again, and that was the Lord Jesus wants to just come and meet with us individually. And we, we have just this wonderful worship. We have this wonderful, the words that we've been receiving. And, and yet, wow, Lord, more of your presence, more of your presence. That's what we desire. So we welcome you online as well this morning. And thank you for all your comments. Keep the comments coming. Keep the testimonies coming. And go God, go God, go God. So Father, thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for being here. And can we be so bold, Lord, to just say, let us have an encounter with you, Lord Jesus. Let us have, let us, every individual here, we could be doing something else. We could be working. We could be vacationing. We could be anywhere else, doing anything else, but we want you, Lord. We want to encounter you, and we welcome you in this place today. Be glorified. Be glorified. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Each day is another chance to bless your holy name. Each day is another opportunity to tell you how much we love you. You gave us breath today. We want to thank you for another day in your presence. Oh, how we love to worship you. It's what we were created to do. So we come boldly to your throne. We come into your presence. You are our 
touch your heart, Lord. We want to hold on to your heart, Lord, and never let go. <laughs> never let go. So let your glory fall in this room, in this room, Lord. Let your glory fall on us today and sweep us, sweep us away into your presence, away into your glory. Oh, it's swept away. Let your glory just cover us today. Us, we will bless you as long as we live. We will lift up our hands in your name. We've seen you in your sanctuary. We held your power and glory. And our response is to bless you. Bless everything you do, Lord. Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name, oh, oh, oh. 
bless your name. Bless your name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless your Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. So bless the Lord. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. We bless your Forgive all my sins and heal all my diseases. And you crown me with loving kindness. You satisfy my soul with all your things. And you crown me with loving kindness. And you crown me with tender mercy.
But Lord, we tell you today, surely as we stand here, we will not forget all of your benefits. Surely as we live, surely as we breathe, Lord, we will not forget all of your benefits. We will not forget all of your benefits. We will not forget all of your benefits. We will not forget all of your benefits, Lord. We will not forget all of your benefits. You heal our diseases, forgive all our sins. Crowned us with your love and kindness, crowned us with your tender mercy. We will not forget all of your benefits. <laughs> we will not forget, we will not forget all of your benefits. Yeah. Sing that with me. We will not forget all of your benefits. We will not forget all Access granted. Access granted. Access 
Just gazing at his beer, just drinking of his wine, seated at his table. He's a friend of mine. Oh, just sit down and talk with him about the latter day. The former things have passed away. What's on your mind, Jesus? What are you about to do? Oh, whatever you're doing, Lord, <laughs> we're gonna follow you. We only want to do what we see. We only want to say what we hear you saying. We want to speak what we hear you speaking to our hearts. So sit, sit down, come and dine. There's a banquet in take set for you. Let's break bread together. So take the bread, take the wine, divine. 
Fresh oil in my land. Pour your oil in my land. I want to burn for you. I want to burn for you. I want to burn for you. Let him fill you with fresh oil. Fill you with fresh oil. Dripping from the throne. Come and fill us with fresh oil. with fresh fill us with fresh oil dripping from your throne No more burning wick. Only gonna burn fresh oil. It's the overflow that keeps you on the go. So we see.
be your drink offering Caught in your fire, let incense rise. I'm casting down my every crown, and I want to be a sweet sacrifice. The fragrance of a life laid down. So living in you, 
to die is my gain. This passion is what I will bring. The joy of my life is giving to you. The river of my offering. So if you're ever thirsty, if you're ever thirsty, Jesus, take a drink of my love. I pour it out. I pour it out. Jesus, take a drink of my love. I pour it out. I pour it out over you. Over you. Over you. Oh, 
apple wine. You are the apple wine. You are the apple wine. So pour out your offering. Pour out a drink for the king. giving you the fresh oil not just to keep in your lampstand but to pour it out it's an overflow it's an overflow come on you're operating out of the overflow today there's no burning out in the overflow you don't burn the wick anymore all you do is burn fresh oil And the oil pours down from the throne and out from his people, and down from the throne and out from his people, down from his throne, out from his people, keeping it fresh, keeping it new, fresh oil.
Come on, just now begin to just pour out the oil of worship. What goes in must come out. <laughs> yeah. Pour it out. last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has stated, out of his heart will flow rivers 
of living water. It's the kind of water that's alive. That out of his heart will flow rivers, rivers, rivers. And then it says, now this he said about the spirit whom those believed in him were about to receive. For as yet, the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. How many of you know that the spirit has now been released not just onto the globe, but has been released into the people of God so that out of your belly, that out of your heart, that out of that, that seed of your mind, your will, and your emotions would flow rivers of living, 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 living waters. How many of you know that you are at your best when you're at rest? Say amen. Come on now. You're at your best when you're at rest. And so isn't it so cool that, that in the presence of the Lord, we get to just like, we get to just like chill out, right? Like we don't have to fake it till we make it. We just get to come exactly the way we are. And then all of a sudden, it's like there's this like revelatory shift that takes place in our mind where we realize that the river of God is inside of us. And that we can actually begin to be refreshed by the river of God that's 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 um that's flowing with inside of us and how you know that that there's that there's this mandate for the river of god to begin to come up to yep to be able to bubble up from inside of us and begin to flow outside of us yeah absolutely you know sometimes it's kind of like like there's a lot of people um running around a lot of christians sometimes they're running around trying to find a river so that they can suck it up <laughs> But now you know that we've been called to be uh, 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 like, a, like, a, like, a, like, like a geyser. That we've been called to be a launching point of the river of God. So that we're not, we're not running around with our straws. We're running around like living fire extinguishers, right? We're running around like this, like this, this source of everlasting, a bottomless drink. Yep, 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 yep. And here's the reality is that you've got the Holy Spirit in you. You got the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. So right now, I just declare refreshing, 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 refreshing. That, that wow, that the river of life would begin to bubble up. Yep, even from a seat of authority within you, that the river of God would just be loose right now. That it would come up, come up, come up, bubble up, bubble up. We just prophesy, spring up a well. Splish, splash, spring up a well. Spring up, spring up, spring up. Rivers. Rivers, rivers, rivers. Oh, if you're thirsty this morning, just take a big drink. Take a big drink. Isn't it cool? I just think it's cool that Jesus is like, if anyone's thirsty, meaning that Jesus actually cares, that he actually cares when we're thirsty, when we, when we need more. That when, that, that when we're tired, when we're weak, when we're weak of soul, that we have a God who cares, that we don't, we don't have a father that says, buck up, man up, get over yourself, do your job, darn it. We have a father that actually cares when we're thirsty, when we, when we need more. That we actually have a shepherd who, against our own will, will actually make us lie down in green pastures besides still water. Somebody was just telling me recently that there's something about sheep where they won't just lie down like, like a shepherd would actually have to grab a lamb and force it to lay down in order to, in order to get to rest. And there's something about, sometimes there's, there's something about our own, our own character where, where we're so committed to what the Lord is doing. We're so committed to our task. And sometimes God, just in His grace, has to come and make us lie down so that he can restore our soul. And there's that kind of anointing. There's that kind of grace for refreshing this morning. We're just like, now you get to just lay down today in green pastures besides still waters so I can restore your mind. I can restore your will. I can restore your emotions. Because you're at your best when you're at rest. Amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just take a big drink right now. Just take a big drink of his intoxicating love. His love is better than wine. His banner over you this morning is love. We love you, Jesus. It's all, I, all I'm 
anxiety, all angst, all worry. Just let it go. Just let it go. Let it go. And just take a big drink. Whoa, a big drink. Wow, a big drink. A big drink. He's concerned about your sobriety. <laughs> He's like... <laughs> Sometimes our sobriety concerns our father. He's like, you just need a big drink. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Take a big drink right now. Whoa, of his refreshing grace this morning. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> wow, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. <laughs> Whoa, yeah, 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 yeah. We love you, Jesus. Hey, de bamba da bamba da bamba. Whoa, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh. <laughs> a little song I wrote Gonna sing it note for note Don't worry Be happy Landlord said your rent is late You might have to litigate Prophesy, Steve Don't worry Thus saith the Lord Be happy Take it, take it, take it Steve, that, that really resonated with me. <laughs> I feel the river on that. Bro, that was confirmation. That was like confirmation. Absolutely. Did that resonate with you? 
Come on. Let's sow into refreshing this morning. Is that good? Just, just, let's just sow into refreshing. Just a, a declarative offering that there's a river of refreshing flowing through our region. I tell you, Sean Bowles just released this incredible word in Pasadena just this last weekend on rest. And that rest is really a prerequisite to run with revival. He actually said that right now the enemy is trying to wear people out so that they don't have the stamina to run with this move of God that's coming. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's so important that we are looking at our priorities, that we're looking at what we're applying our hand. And it's so important that we're not just doing stuff, right? That we're not just doing stuff. We're not just keeping busy to keep busy, um, but that we're really looking at what we're doing. What, we're really, really looking at our priorities. And, and, that, and, and, and maybe you're in a season right now where you're not creating a start doing list, but maybe you're in a season right now where you need to create a stop doing list. That, that, you, that you would say that I'm going to value rest. And I'm going to begin storing up equity in, 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 my, in my rest account. I'm going to start storing. How many of you, you, uh, you feel guilty when you rest? Like, how many of you, like, 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 just sitting down and, like, watching a movie is, like, the most difficult thing in the world? Like, just hanging out with your spouse is just painful. You know, like, it's, it's time to begin st- val- valuing that time. You know, how many of you know that, that rest? How many of you know that just going out for a walk or going out for a hike, you know, turning off your cell phone? How many of you know that that's, like, worship unto the Lord, you know, when your heart is in it. And, and so, man, I just thought that Sean just brought the best, of j- j- just such an incredible, it's such an incredible word. So if you're, if you're tired, if you're weak right now, uh, that's just, this is just a moment. This is just a reminder that, that the Lord's saying, hey, it's time to seek first the kingdom of God and his, and his righteousness. Yep, not our own kingdom, but let's just come into a place of rest, relaxation, even for the rest of the summer, just kind of preparing for what the Lord wants to do this fall. So, yep, th- this week, you camp meeting, it's a little intense. But when this, w- when this week is over, <laughs> let's, let's rest hard. Let's, let's worship hard this week. Let's, let's drink hard this week, you know. And then, and then let's, let's rest and let's begin to prepare for what the Lord's going to be releasing this fall. Is that good? And so if you haven't done so yet, if you're watching online, uh, please join us uh, by giving online. So into what God's doing here in the Pacific Northwest. So into what God's doing here in, uh, uh, in, in Seattle. Um, uh, so into Jeremy Nelson and Papa Che on. To do that, put the amount in on your phone and text 425-441-3403. The number's on your screen. Um, and so do that. I wish we had like a, a whole call center full of people with red telephones taking your calls with your, but we're kind of past that era, aren't we? <laughs> you can do it here as well uh, with a check SRC, and you can always give with cash. We'll leave the baskets out so that you can be trading into what the Lord is doing throughout this service um, as as well. Is that you? Yeah. With that music? Yeah. Oh, that's peace, awesome. Peace like a river. Oh, that's great. Come on. <laughs> Awesome. I'm easily distracted. It doesn't take, it doesn't take very much. I mean, uh, <laughs> and also, how many of you have been enjoying this, this, this week so far? You, you, you enjoyed, um, how many of you just loved uh, Jeremy Nelson's word on dreams and visions and just the teaching that he brought yesterday? And how many of you loved last night uh, Papa Che's uh, uh, historical narrative on revival and the, and the move of God and how to know when you're in a move and how to prepare for a move and, and just that impartation at the end of the meeting? Um, if you want to uh, 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 go through all of this content again, and I would encourage you to do that, um, uh, it's our gift to you. All the audio and video, it's all free. Um, you can download it right onto your phone. Just get the Seattle Revival Center app on iTunes or Google Play. So go and do that um, so that you can listen to these messages over and over and over again. Um, look, we're, we're in for a, a special treat this morning. Uh, Papa Che is in the house um, and, uh, and it's just such an honor to, ha- to have you here. Thank you for what you brought last night. Thank you for just being uh, uh, with us. Such short of notice, he was able to squeeze us into his itinerary and, and make this happen. Um, and it's such an honor to have you here. We'd like to receive you this morning. Please welcome Papa Che on to Seattle Revival Center. Right. Thank, you Thank you so kind to be seated. Thank you. Again, such an honor for me to be here. And so proud of Jeremy and Darren and the next generation of revivalists. And uh, it's amazing how we are going from glory to glory. You believe that? You know, some people have this uh, gloom and doom theology, but 
You know, everywhere I see in scripture, I just see passages like Proverbs 4, 18. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It shines brighter and brighter until the full day. How many know the best days are ahead for you? Do you believe that? And I, at the end of the day, we win, right? The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Amen. It's not that we don't go through tribulation, you know, but tribulation... It's interesting because, you know, we've all gone through, I mean, I can tell you from 1984 to 94 were, were the 10 worst years of my life. Uh, I said the 80s were from Hades. That's how bad it was. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, I was just in this wilderness, and I couldn't get out of it. And, you know, everything I did, I mean, prior to that, I was part of a mega church, 3,000-member church, came out to California based on a dream, a prophetic dream, a black man appeared to me and said, come to Los Angeles for there's going to be a great harvest. And so we experienced harvest in D.C., 2,000-member Bible study, 3,000-member church. I come to California. I thought the revival was going to break out. And after one year, we had 20 people. That includes Lou's family and my family. Lou had seven kids. I had four kids. We call it church growth, by the way. <laughs> and we said, where's the God of revival? We're, we're the people, you know? And so when you've been used to that, and you come out to the city of angels, the city where the Jesus people movement started, the history of Azusa Street. I mean, Los Angeles has incredible revival history. So we come out to L.A. and nothing. And there were many times I would be on the floor just weeping, just saying, God, you know, I've sold everything. I know no one out here came out for a revival. And where's the God of revival? And, um, but, you know, I don't have any regrets for those 10 years because... How I many you know God uses those things to help develop character? And I remember John Wimber saying, don't ever trust a man who doesn't walk with a limp. And what he was saying is, is that everyone that's used by God, you know, has to go through that Jacob wrestling with the angel moment. And you just have to persevere through that. And when you come out smelling like Christ, you become more Christ-like. And, um, I mean, it's amazing. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It doesn't say Israel, his name, was changed to Israel, as you know. But his old name, Jacob, supplanter, is always highlighted. And the reason why, because I believe, this is my, th uh, this is my theory, <clears throat> I believe is because it was Jacob who wrestled with God. We call that a Christophany. He wrestled with Jesus and he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. There's something about that kind of hunger where you're saying, I'm not going to let you go until you bring revival. It's like John Knox, give me Scotland, or I'm going to die. And so I think he's looking for people who are saying, I'm not going to let you go until you bring revival to Seattle, to the Northwest, to America. And, um, and so, you know, I was saved in revival. And basically, I, you know, I'm just basically, my life is to see the glory cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Habakkuk 2.14. And so we know that's going to happen. And so we're contending for that. And we are seeing it. And the way I say we're in revival but more is coming. Amen? There's always more. And so we've been in revival, really, for the last 50 years, actually, in America, but different waves and different manifestations, different revelation coming. And one of the revelations that he's giving us is that he wants to reform America. He wants to reform the nations. And what does that look like? I wrote a book called God Wants to Bless You, and this is based on Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3, that God wants to bless you so that all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So it's not being blessed for the sake of being blessed. It's for a purpose. And it's based on Psalm 67 as well, where the psalmist says, God, be merciful to me, bless me, cause your face to shine upon me, which is very important because the face of God is the presence of God in the Bible, that your ways may be known on earth and salvation among the nations. Now, that's a reformational prayer. God wants to bless you so that the ways of God may be known on earth and salvation for the whole nations, all the nations. What are the ways of God? <clears throat> you notice how the, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The early church was called the way before they came, you know, the, the Christians were first called, or disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. But they were known as the way. And, and the Bible says he would teach us his ways. The ways of God is all about reformation, the way to do life, the way to have a marriage that's successful, biblical. I mean, you know, in a few weeks, my wife and I are going to celebrate our 38th, 38th anniversary. Can we thank God for that? 
Now, for most of those 38 years, it's been absolutely heaven on earth. Most of it. We did hit a bump on the road in 1992. And I remember distinctly we had to fight in the kitchen. And I said, how could God make you so beautiful and stupid at the same time? And she replied saying, well, God made me beautiful, so you'll marry me. He made me stupid, so I end up marrying you. So that's how the fight started. <laughs> no, that's just a joke. But we did have a fight in 92. We did. And, um, and, and uh, we went to a marriage counselor. But it was when the Holy Spirit fell in 94 that God healed our marriage. That's why I love the river. When people criticize, and they say, I say, you have no idea what you're talking about. It saved our marriage. It's priceless. And I write about it very transparently in my book, Into the Fire, and Say Goodbye to Powerless Christianity. And so, so it's a way to raise kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord. All my kids have been walking with Jesus ever since they were small, and uh, two of them are in full-time ministry. It's a way to do business with integrity. It's a way to do government without corruption. It's about life. And so this is about Reformation, and so I want to give this away. Who's celebrating a birthday during this week? Anyone celebrating a birthday this week during the conference? <laughs> Who do we have over here? Who? Come on up here, man. This is for you. Listen, at the end of the, uh, <clears throat> my session, I'm going to be by the book table, and I'm going to do some book signing. <clears throat> I'd love to just, just get to know you, meet you, and, uh, and bless you in any way I can. And so, uh, so I want to talk about Reformation, but I want to give three key words that are Greek words that Jesus intentionally, as he spoke Aramaic, but he used the Greek intentionally. And these three words are, number one, I want to talk about apostolos or apostle. Number two, I want to use the word euangelion or gospel. The third word is ecclesia, which is the word for church. Okay, we're going to look at all three uh, this morning, and this is a little bit more of a teaching, more of an equipping session, but I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 6. Why did Jesus call the 12 apostles? Why not prophets? Israel had a history of prophets. I don't know if you know that Abraham was called a prophet, Moses a prophet. Then, of course, you have the prophets like the Daniels and Elijah and Elijah, Elijah Revolution, right? And, um, you know, so you've had a history of prophets going up to John the Baptist, but he doesn't use that religious term. He doesn't even call them priests. Now, they are priests. I mean, no, all of us are priests. Amen? Amen. But if he used that term, they would have understood, yes, okay, maybe this is a new wineskin. This is a new priestly order. But look at this in verse uh, 12 now. Luke 6, verse 12. Now, it came to pass in those days he went up to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. By the way, you see the humanity of Christ. He's 100% God. How many believe that he's God? Am I speaking to the right group here this morning? Are you awake this morning? He's 100% God and 100% man. He's a ministry. Now, he didn't give up his deity. He embraced humanity. And he chose while he was on the earth, when he started his ministry, to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. If he was functioning as God, he would know the 12 immediately. But he spent all night doing listening prayer, seeking God's face, who are the 12, I'm to a point. So he continued all night in prayer, and then when it was day, verse 13, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. He used a secular word at that time, and you have to understand how that was used in the context of the Roman Empire, because the Roman Empire had apostles. The Romans, as they, their whole MO was to conquer land and terror to and expand their kingdom. And as they did so, they realized unless they brought Roman culture to the conquered territory, the people would revolt and go back to their barbarian ways. To ensure that Roman culture got inculcated into that conquered area, they sent an apostle. He was either a general or an admiral, if it was a coastal city, or a governor. And his responsibility was to change the culture into the Roman culture so if the emperor showed up, he would feel at home. Now, how many of you have been to Israel? Any of you? All right. If you go to Israel, you've got to go to Caesarea by the sea. Archaeologists have dug up that place, and it's like a little Rome. You have a hippodrome there. You have a coliseum there. All the architecture is Roman. And here it's in Israel. Why? Because 
Pilate did not live in Jerusalem. His office was at Caesarea by the sea. And he transformed that city into a Roman city so that if the emperor showed up, he would show up at Caesarea by the sea, not in Jerusalem, that he would feel at home with the architect the culture there. So Jesus now says to his 12, my kingdom's not of this world, but I do have a kingdom culture. It looks like heaven. And I'm calling you to bring heaven's culture wherever you go. So when we talk about being apostolic, how many know, let me put it this way, how many know we're all to be evangelistic, even though we may not, may not be called to be a Todd White or a Billy Graham as an evangelist? How many know we're all to be prophetic, even though we may not be a, a Jeremy Nelson or a Bobby Connor? Right? We're, my sheep hear my voice. John 10, 27, I know them and they follow me. We're all to hear. So when we say, okay, we're not all called to be apostles, the Ephesians 4, 11, office of an apostle, but we're to be apostolic. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, you're carriers of the glory, Colossians 1, 27, Christ sent you the hope of glory, and you're to bring heaven's culture wherever you go. I was just uh, sharing with uh, Jean and Mary in the car coming over here because I'm in a Christian ghetto. And what I mean is I'm in conferences every week. I fly to Washington, D.C., speak there. And the next week I'm in Taiwan. And it's like this in my life. Every week I'm in a different city. And so I have to be intentional when I'm in, quote, the world. In other words, for example, uh, I could pick four or five people in my, my church that could cut my hair. But for years I went to an unbeliever because <clears throat> I wanted to shift the atmosphere at the barbershop. And I wanted to reach out to my barber who was a Buddhist. You know, his name is Bioshi. And, uh, and so I went there, and, you know, how many of you know you have his attention when he's cutting your hair 30 minutes, you have a chance to share the God? And I did, and I eventually led him to the Lord. But not only did I lead him to the Lord, everyone in the barbershop got saved. There were other stylists, seven of them. And so I had to be intentional about going. So I could pick a dentist who's a believer, but I went to an unbeliever. Uh, and, and so we've got to realize that we are carriers of the glory and we're to bring right. heaven's culture wherever we go. Right. Now I'm just talking about salvation because there's no one lost in heaven, but let's talk about injustice. There's no injustice in heaven. There's no racism in heaven. There's no sick person in heaven. So we're going to talk about the gospel in a moment, euangelion. But, but so we need to take all of heaven and bring it here on earth. And so... Jesus gives the apostles, remember in Matthew 6, they come to Jesus and teach us how to pray. And I said last night that we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really uh, a misnomer. It shouldn't be titled the Lord's Prayer because in the prayer it says, forgive us of our sins. And Jesus never sinned. It really is the apostles' prayer and the disciples' prayer. And so we're to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth as it is in heaven. It really is an apostolic prayer because we're praying heaven down to earth. So this is God's heart that we be reformers, okay? That a reformation is all about heaven invading earth, all right? But it's not just bringing salvation to individuals, it's discipling nations. Will you turn with me to Matthew 28? I want to look at the Great Commission again. And uh, this is... Uh, <clears throat> Of course, Mark's account, uh, Mark 16 and uh, 17 and on, is one account of the Great Commission. But the other account is Matthew 28, and this is important to look at. Verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, this is important because he underscores on earth. Now, we know heaven's his throne. But the Bible says that the prince of this world, that Satan had authority. And uh, when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he showed him all the kingdoms of this world. And he said, I'll give you all these kingdoms if you worship me. Now, it would not have been a true temptation unless he actually had authority to give the kingdoms. So he's called the prince of this world. But how I many you know when Jesus died on the cross... He disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public display. He took the authority back that was lost in the garden. Man had authority, but he lost it in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, as you know, in the garden. And now he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In other words, implying that I've now delegated this authority to you. You now have it back. Through the cross, you now have authority. How many know we have authority? Everything's under our feet. 
And so he says, I've given you authority, Luke 10, 19, to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing will harm you. Now, I want to just say Satan has power still, but he has no more authority. We have the authority. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right. So the Satan is real. I'm not minimizing, but I don't also want to blow him up where we you know, make him like the yin and the yang of God. Look, Satan is a created being. We're created being. You, me, the trees here in Seattle, the amazing, all of us, we had a beginning. But God never had a beginning. In the beginning, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And Jesus, in the beginning, was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 1, right? So Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. And so that's why he is God. He's uncreated. It's the mystery of the Trinity, but, but uh, perfect unity, but oneness, but yet three personalities. So anyway, he says, all authority has been given to me, and I'm delegating that authority to you, because that's the key. If you don't have authority, you can't take nations. Because the authority, and I'm going to talk about the authority we have as the ecclesia in a moment, how we can shift nations. We can shift things, and it really begins with our declaration, our decrees. In my book, God Wants to Bless You, I give 10 apostolic decrees. And, and I, I share that Moses of Jesus' prayers were not intercessory. They were decrees. Like stretch forth your hand to the man with the withered arm. Take up your mat and walk. Lazarus, come forth. Why? Because kings make decrees. But how many of you know you're all kings and priests? Yeah. Revelation 1, 6, you're kings and priests. Revelation 5, 10, you're kings and priests. I like the way it says in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a royal priesthood. So emphasizing your royalty, your kings, and your priest. And the highest form of prayer is when you hear from God and then you make the decree, and that's when things shift. So let me give you an example. We were doing the call of San Francisco where Jeremy got saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure it was salvation, but you got baptized and you were at the call of San Francisco 2002. And we were at Candlestick Park, 45,000 people there. I don't think that stadium even exists now. They tore it down in this monster stadium, some other stadium. But, but uh, we had invited Governor Gray Davis, who was the governor of California at that time, to come to the call. And the reason why is that Lou had a dream that Governor Davis was at the call gathering. So, you know, he said, is it prophetic or is it real? Should we... And so we thought, well, we're not sure, so why don't we go ahead and invite him? Of course, he did not come. He didn't even respond to the letter of invitation. And so we're at the call, and we're coming to the place where we're now praying for the government, praying for the president at that time, and then also the governor of California. Lou, sits, I'm sitting next to him, he says, I think you should make a decree that God will either save Governor Davis or remove him for office. And now we have this thing that Lou and I have because I, I, you know, we have an understanding of how apostles and prophets work. Prophets have a high level of revelation. They are able to hear major macro words. But apostles have the authority to, to shift things. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. That word first is a very strong Greek word. It's proton, word second, deuteron. Third, Triton. If you look up Proton in the Strong's Concordant, it means first in authority. How many know we're all the same, amen? But there are different levels of authority. Your parents have more authority than you, right? The government has authority. And it's very important to understand your pastors have authority, all right? And so this is something that really is not being taught because we don't want to have excess and we don't want to have abuse. But sometimes we throw the baby out with the bathwater, all right? And so we're all equal before God, but there's different levels of authority. And so he's given apostles authority. So Lou understands that and says, I think you should make the decree that Governor Davis will be removed or he will be saved. And I said, okay. So I went up to the mic and I said, brothers and sisters, we want to pray for the governor of California right now. We're in California. And let's make a decree that he would either get saved or he would be removed from the office. Now, when we talk about being removed from the office, we're thinking the next term. You know, every four years, his, his election is up, you know. This was on April the 2nd, 2002. Two days later, a petition drive begins in Orange County to have him removed. Yeah. 
from office. You have to have a million signatures in order to bring it up to the ballot in that uh, fall election, the November election, to have them removed. Never in the history of America has a governor been removed, a sitting government has been removed through a petition drive. But it happens in California. And by November, he's out of office, and guess who we end up electing? The Terminator, <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> the point I want to make is that it begins, it begins in the heavenly realms. You hear from God, so we can see the shifts taking place. And right now we're saying, God, remove ungodly Supreme Court judges, or retire them, or reform them, save them. Amen? Can we agree with that? Yeah. Remove them, retire them, or, you know, and we're not cursing them. It's just that we have authority to shift. And so apostles do that. Apostles are there, and that's why we all need to be apostolic, because we're to bring God's kingdom manifestation here on earth. So let's go to the second word. Um, well, going back to Matthew 28, he says, all authority has been given to me. And then he says this, go therefore make disciples of all nations. How many know Jesus is serious about us disciples nations? He's not just saying win converts. That's the beginning part of it, very important part. But it says make disciples of nations. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. And so we're to teach you know, there's a, uh, and I, uh, forgive me for going out on this, but there's, I've been running into some young people who are saying that the, the gospel is part of the old covenant and uh, that Jesus hadn't died then. And so really just the New Testament is Pauline letters and the book of Acts and all that. I said, that is so ridiculous. What do you do with this passage here teaching them to say, obey everything I've commanded you? The, the gospels con contain the teachings of Jesus. You know, and, and so, you know, it's a hyper grace teaching. We just have to be careful. That's nothing new. It's called antinomianism, and that's appeared in church history. It keeps on popping up every several hundred years or so, and we're seeing that again now, saying that we don't have to confess our sins. What Jesus taught uh, in the prayer, you know, uh, it's, it's old covenant. We're the righteousness of God, and, and so, but what I have problems with, what do you do with First John 1, 9? That's in the New Testament, you know, if... We confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and deliver us from all unrighteousness. Yes, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. All right, there's no question about it, but we still have to practice it, and we do sin. And when we do, we're to confess our sins. In fact, that's the key to healing. James 5, 15, 16, confess your sins to one another, and then pray for one another that you may be what? Amen. Healed, amen. All right, so we looked at the word apostle, and we, God wants us to be apostolic. He wants us to bring kingdom culture wherever we go. Can I hear an amen? Are you with me? All right. The second word is euangelion, the word gospel. Now, the word, the phrase gospel of salvation never appears in the New Testament. It's the gospel of the kingdom. The word kingdom appears just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John 129 times. It's the gospel of the kingdom. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations, and then the end will come. Again, we have to use that word, understand it in the Roman context. The Romans used the word gospel, euangelion. You know when they used it? When an invasion was taking place. Why would an invasion be called good news? Because they said it was a done deal. They knew they were going to win the battle. And so when they would conquer Palestine, for example, they called that the gospel. Invasion of Palestine, they were going to take over, and they already won the battle, even before the battle was over. And so what God is saying, and, and, the, and the New Testament writers use the word euangelion intentionally, that is an invasion of his kingdom rule, where demons are cast out, people are healed, and it's a done deal, we've won. And so that takes on a different meaning when we understand it's not just souls being saved, it's bringing his rule and reign to come. And the best person to really show the visual picture of this is found in Daniel chapter 2. Remember Daniel? He is uh, part of the, the council to Nebuchadnezzar with Shadrach, Meshach, and the other astrologers and uh, people who are really witches in, during the sorcerers and part of that council. And so Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, right? And he sees this incredible statue and... And he says to all his wise counsel, tell me the dream I had and then give me the interpretation. 
And they respond by saying, well, tell us a dream and we'll give you the interpretation. He says, I don't trust you guys. You're going to lie and make something up. If you tell me the dream, then I'll know you really have the right interpretation. And they say, no one can do that. And so Nebuchadnezzar gets ticked off and makes a decree, a kingly decree, and said, all of you are going to be executed. So Daniel hears the word that he's going to be executed. So he begins to see God, not only on his behalf, but on behalf of his friends. And God gives him the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. He's ushered in front of the king. And he is so humble, he said, no man can do what you're asking, but there's a God who knows all things. And he revealed it to me, what you dreamt of. You saw a statue with a gold head. And that gold represents you and your kingdom, uh, the power, the wealth. But there's going to be another kingdom that's going to come after you that's inferior. That's why you saw the second part of the dream as being a silver chest. And then another kingdom after that, and he was talking about the Persians and the Medes, and then who's going to have the bronze waist. He was talking about the Greek. And then there's going to be another culture that's going to have iron legs, and the Romans invented iron. And during that period, a small rock is going to come out of nowhere and hit the feet, and the statue is going to crumble, and the wind is going to blow the, blow the dust of the statue to the four corners of the world, and that small statue will grow to be a large mountain, and the mountain is going to cover the earth. And he gives the interpretation of the different kingdoms, and that small, statue, that small rock is the kingdom of his Jesus coming. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, Galatians 4.4, 4, during the Roman Empire. And Jesus established the kingdom. He says, I want you to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand now. You could have it right now. In other words, you don't have to die to go to heaven. You can experience heaven right now here on earth. And that's why he showed the, the signs of the kingdom, healing every sickness, casting out every demon, how I many know there's no one running around demonized in heaven, amen? No one running around like the Gadarene demon, demoniac, naked in heaven. No. And that's why we're to bring his kingdom. We're to preach the gospel of the kingdom, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. Freely you receive, freely give. And so his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. The church, and I'm going to talk about the church next, is temporal. Churches die. In fact, in America, 4,000 church buildings close down every year. Most of them are mainline denominational churches. And as the boomers are getting into the retirement age, there are a lot of church buildings closing down because they didn't reach the next generation. And it's just a bunch of, you know, grandparents holding on to that, you know, building. And you know who's buying these buildings, by the way, are Muslims. Or they're turning, I mean, you go, to, you go to Europe, it's amazing, these amazing cathedrals that were once a bastion of Christianity are now Muslim-owned, uh, 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 and they're becoming restaurants and historic, you know, you know, basically museum pieces. And so churches come and go, but here's what God says, my kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. It has no end. That's why we need to be kingdom-minded, kingdom-hearted. You know, I was just, uh, we are just talking about the call, uh, just talking with Darren and Jeremy right before, we just drinking coffee in, the, in, the, in his office. And, and I shared with them that, um, you know, our church grew real quickly. We started in 1994. By 1999, we had over 1,000 members. But when we started to mobilize for the call, which started in 2000, Lou and I, we thought it was just going to be one event and it ended up being seven events in three years. So I was gone from the pastorate for three years, and I turned the church over to my executive pastor. We went from 1,100 down to 550. And so almost half the church left because the two founding pastors were gone, mobilizing for the call. And so it would be like if Darren took off, you know, for three years, what would this church look like three years later, right? And so everything rises and falls with leadership. But, you know, I had no regrets, even though we had a lot of people leave and we lost finances, et cetera. Why? Because... It was about the kingdom. It's not building your church. It's about the kingdom. We were events in God's kingdom. But here's the point I want to make is that it was right after 2003, the next year, God gives us a $28 million building. That's outrageous. And, um, and of course, the numbers came back once I came back to the pulpit. And we've tripled since then, okay? So the point I want to make is that here's what he says. If you seek first my kingdom 
and do what's right, I'll take care of everything else. I'll take care of your church. Most people, you know, Peter Wagner teaches about the kingdom ladder, and he says there's three runs to the ladder. The first is a focus on your needs and yourself. That's where the majority of people are at in the body of Christ. They come to services, for example, and say, how could I get my needs met? There's nothing wrong with that. You know, we want a breakthrough, a financial breakthrough, a relational breakthrough. We want to get healed. The second focus is focused on the church, and this is where a lot of pastors are at. All of them want to see their church grow. They want to see increase in finances. They want to see good members uh, and people volunteering. But the third rung of the ladder is focused on the kingdom. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 30, 33, seek first his kingdom and do what's right. And all these things will be added unto you. And because uh, God gave me that revelation early on to be kingdom-minded, kingdom-hearted, I knew, even though we were losing members, that we were advancing the kingdom of God and God would take care of the rest. And sure enough, he gave us this building, gave us the people back, and more so. And so we need to be kingdom-minded. And it's about advancing his kingdom. All right? His kingdom, though, is not just on the church mountain. His rule and reign is in every area of life, all right? And this is where the Seven Mountain comes in because Seven Mountains, for those who don't know about the Seven Mountain Mandate, you have to go back to 1973 where um, Lauren Cunningham, the founder of Youth with a Mission, and Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, they were having a lunch meeting. But that morning, in their quiet time, God gave them both a strategy on how to disciple a whole nation that if you break down a nation into seven spheres of influence or seven major institutions, family, religion, government, education, business, media, arts and entertainment, Jeremy has to take off the airports. Let's say all goodbye to Jeremy. Jeremy, we love you. Thank you so much. <laughs> that everyone is on one or multiple mountains. And the fact is, is that, you know, people who, like Jeremy and myself, Darren, only 1% of the church is in vocational full-time ministry in America, based on George Barna. 1%. 99% are in the marketplace. And it's a ridiculous thing that we're going to bring his kingdom rule through the one percenters. <laughs> are you kidding me? I get exhausted thinking about that. How do we decide? Our job is to equip you for the work of ministry. Can I hear an amen? amen. How many know all of you are ministers? Amen. All of you are revivalists. All of you are reformers. And so in your sphere, you're to bring the kingdom. So let me give you my son-in-law as an example. My son-in-law is a high school teacher. And, um, you know, so he's not the president. I mean, th there's only one president, okay? Now, let's believe God. Uh, each election, uh, every four years, to, to have someone that would represent his kingdom. Uh, you don't, we're, not, we're not talking about necessarily being saved, but to have his kingdom values in his public policy, biblical values in his kingdom, in the public policy. But my son is a high school coach. He's a basketball coach, and he's a high school teacher. Now, this is somewhat of an anomaly because he's Korean. And usually coaches, you know, are not Korean coaches, you know. How many know there are not a lot of Koreans in the NBA? In fact, there's zero. There's not one. Only one Asian, that's Jeremy Lin, all right? Yao Ming was once a Chinese, and Jeremy now, uh, who's a believer, by the way, is uh, the other Asian. So we're vertically challenged, right? But, <laughs> but we're good coaches. And so my, my son um, had a basketball team, and, you know, it was above average, the... the um, were 18 and 12 uh, three years ago. And, um, but they got really hot in the LA finals and city championship, and they won the city championship. So all the starters were returning the following year, which is now a year ago. And so USA Today comes out with the top 25 high school basketball teams in the nation. And because they won the city championship, even though their record was a little bit of over 500, they were ranked in the top 25, which was amazing. And so with that, what happens is that when you rank in the top 25, they have special tournaments just for your team. So they create team tournaments in New York City, in Miami, Las Vegas, Seattle. There was a tournament here. 
and uh, of course in Los Angeles. And so my son's team got invited to play the best, to the, play the other 25 because in their normal schedule you wouldn't play them uh, in the nation. You would just play the teams in your league, right? But uh, because they created this uh, incredible um, system of playing the top team. So my son's team started to play against the top teams and they start to win every single game. So now they're in a tournament in Miami. They play against the number one team in the nation was also undefeated. They're both undefeated at the time. And he wins. Now he's on Sports Center. He's on Fox Sports. And they're interviewing him. And he's giving Jesus the praise and glory. Because he's a spirit filled believer. As a high school person, the, all of a sudden God begins to raise him up. He's interviewed by the Wall Street Journal. They, they are following and tracking him. And uh, so he wins the Naismith Coach of the Year. They go undefeated. And uh, they're like 38. They win everything, including the city final, the state championship. And so they're ranked number one in the country and platform. The doors open up for him. How many know all of us, even though we may not be, you know, the president of the United States, all of us are called to be the head? Deuteronomy 28, 13, you're to be the head and not the tail, to be above, not beneath. So in his fear, he believed God, that God's favor would be upon him. And all of a sudden, you know, he's speaking to the whole student body because he won the championship and shares the gospel with 3,000 students in his high school. So here's one guy in his fear becomes a reformer, brings his kingdom rule wherever he goes. So, you know, you have a sphere. All of you have a sphere. It's called metron in the Greek. And so you have to recognize, okay, I am a minister. How many know work is not a four-letter curse word? <laughs> you may hate your job, but I want you to know something. God created work. God worked six days. He himself worked and rested on the seventh. And the revival and the reformation that's going to take place, I'm prophesying this, is not going to be with the 1% in the local church. It's going to be you in the workplace. It's going to be my son, who's a high school coach, and is just changing and leading all these kids who are basketball players to the Lord. And so I want to just say that you are, <laughs> you are the ecclesia, and this goes to the final word with the last 10 minutes. Let me talk about the ecclesia. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. So we looked at the word apostolos. We looked at the word uh, euangelion, the gospel of the kingdom, okay, which is beyond just salvation, all right? It's bringing his rule and reign. Now let's look at the word ecclesia because, again, Jesus intentionally uses the word ecclesia, which is a Greek word. He could have called them synagogues because synagogues were in existence then. Synagogues came into being during the Babylonian captivity. When the Jewish people were taken into captivity and they were no longer able to, they destroyed, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, which got rebuilt under Zerubbabel, but there was no place to worship. And so they just came up with this role where 10 Jewish people gathered together, men gathered together, they could form a congregation called a synagogue. But he doesn't use that term, I'm going to build my synagogue and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He uses a separate term that was used in Athens a few hundred years before when the people realized that in order to govern well, they had to pick people from the city of Athens to be part of what's called the ecclesia. It was a legislative body, and they made the decision, governmental decision for their city. What we today, we would have a republic. You know, we would have people that we would vote in or have representative for the House of Representatives or senators for the Senate, right? Well, the Greeks founded that form of government. And that government, if you will, the legislative body is called the ecclesia. So here's what Jesus says in Matthew uh, 16. And this is reading from verse um, 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? Now, Caesarea Philippi is different from Caesarea by the sea. Caesarea by the sea is a coastal city, right? Caesarea Philippi is all the way north, top of the geography of Israel by, by Mount Hermon. And you have to, we're talking about several days' journey walking. Why would he take them all the way up to Caesarea Philippi? How many of you have been to Caesarea Philippi? Okay. Because you come to this huge cave, a natural cave, 
right there, carved out of the mountains. And there's a natural altar there. And according to historians, pagan rituals took place on that altar in that cave for hundreds of years. Some say even human sacrifice. Our Torah guide said there were human sacrifices uh, made in that cave. So we're talking about a very dark area. So Jesus, even though it's beautiful naturally because it's lush, that's where the Jordan River begins and the rainfall comes to Mount Hermon. That's why Psalm 133 is like the rain that falls upon Mount Hermon to the mountains of Zion. It begins there. So it's very green. It's like Seattle compared to Los Angeles, you know what I'm saying? So it's very lush there. And yet it takes him to the dark cave and he says, says, who do men say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has now revealed this to you, but my father, who's in heaven, you're smart, but not that smart. Actually, Peter was kind of thick. But you receive this by revelation from my father. And I also say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock, and there's two different words for rock, you know, uh, Petra and Petros. And it was small rock versus a huge boulder. But on the huge boulder of the revelation of who I am, yeah. I will build my ecclesia, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, it's amazing how Jesus is using the geographic location to give this message. No matter how dark the world is, with human sacrifice, abortion, same-sex marriage, gender confusion, it doesn't matter because I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell, whatever Satan throws at, it's not going to prevail against the church. We win. How many know we win? Amen. And his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. So I'm going to build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And now he says this, verse 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is very interesting, the way it reads in the Greek. Because the way it reads in the Greek, it says, whatever you bind on earth will first have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will first have been loosed in heaven. In other words, heaven initiates. Yeah. You can't just say, well, I loose a new, you know, Mercedes Benz for myself. <laughs> you know, <laughs> unless God's speaking that to you and you're contending for it. But a lot of times we bind and lose things that God is saying, listen, the Kierkegaard said this, prayer is listening. And God is constantly speaking, but the problem is we're not listening. God is constantly speaking to us, and the highest level of prayer is when he speaks to you, and you, in agreement, bind and lose. You're the ecclesia. You can see miracles happen as you obey the Holy Spirit. And I've given you examples of this, but let me give you another example. We were at the call D.C. Not D.C., but the call Korea, Seoul, Korea. And I'm Korean, and this was a big deal for, for me that we would go and we rented an Olympic stadium. We've been doing stadium events. Uh, each stadium is at least $1 million to rent. And, um, and so we were at Olympic Stadium, and, you know, we thought, you know, this would be easy. It was 80,000 seat, and we thought we would fill that because Yungi Cho uh, was on board. And he says, I'm bringing my whole church. How I many know he could fill that stadium many times over, right? And so we thought, oh, we're going to have an overflow crowd and all that. But that whole week was pouring rain, absolutely torrential rain. And I remember just saying to Lou, I said, Lou, should we cancel it? Is it really bad? And we should cancel this event because we're going to have this open stadium and no one's going to come. And he says, I don't care if it's raining. We're going to be in the mud. We're going to be in the rain. It's a fast, not a festival, you know. He gives me the line that we're going to sacrifice, and so we're going to be in the rain and the mud. I said, okay. So we still have the event. But the problem was is that no one, people did show, we had over 60,000 show up, but they were all inside the stadium walking around and no one was out in the field because they didn't want to get rained on. So after around two hours of this, uh, Lou leans over to me and says, this is not working. <laughs> he said, you need to make an apostolic decree that will stop raining. And I had to ask him, I said, did you really hear from the Lord? Because if you didn't, you make that decree. I'm not going to go up there and make this decree because it's been raining all week and the the forecast is to rain for days after. He said, no, I heard from the Lord. You need to make a decree. And, um, and so, again, this dynamic of apostles and prophets working together. So I grabbed the mic and I said, brothers and sisters, wherever you are in the stadium, just stop walking. Would you just pray for, with us? We're going to 
make a decree and ask God to stop the rain so we could have this call gathering. So I make a decree, just a 20-second decree, in Jesus' name will stop raining, and 60,000 people were there, including my family, my kids, and they all witnessed this. I'm talking about within 10 minutes, it stops raining, and the clouds part, this beautiful sunshine comes right over the stadium, and we're talking about it's November, which is very cold in Korea. There's warmth. It goes to around 60 degrees in that stadium. It was just amazing. It stayed that way, but here's the point I want to make. It was raining all around the stadium except for our stadium. It was an open heaven. And by the way, that day was a national day called Open Heaven Day. <laughs> it's probably one of the greatest miracles I've ever seen because everyone saw it. Because the moment you started leaving the stadium, it's raining on you. And, it, um, and the forecast, we went to the hotel, which just said, isn't that amazing stuff? They said it's been raining all day. And so we had to explain what had happened. People didn't believe it except for the 60,000 who were there. Making a decree from heaven's perspective is the key to prayer. And that's why it's so important that you have authority. This is all tied together. All of you are reformers. In your sphere, God wants you to bind and loose based on his initiative. And as you do that, you will see revival and reformation take place. Now, I want to close by starting with what I shared is that we are now celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. I don't think it's a coincidence that God's speaking to us about reformation. But we need to reform what they reformed. But in 1517, October 31st, this is really important. We're coming up to it in a few months. Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to Wittenberg door and began the Reformation. And basically what he was saying in the 95 Theses, because during that time the Pope was selling indulgence that if you paid money to the church, and this was to raise money to build the uh, cathedral, Peter's Cathedral. If you go to Rome, uh, the basilica there is just immense. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's where um, Michelangelo uh, painted the ceiling. So, but that cost so much money, and so he raised money by selling indulgence. What's indulgence? It's not money to go to heaven. It's to just have less time in purgatory. <laughs> so it's just like, but it duped millions of people into giving money, and, and Martin Luther said, this is ridiculous. This is totally unbiblical. The only way that we're forgiven is by the grace alone, and that's where justification by grace through faith uh, became the major message from that 95 Thesis event. But he was a reformer. He was an apostle. And he didn't just, you know, I mean, he translated the Bible from Latin to common German. You have to realize that most people couldn't read. But when it came out in common German, everyone wanted to learn how to read. So the literacy rate skyrocketed in Germany above all the nations. And to this day, Germans are some of the brightest, the most intelligent, and one of the wealthiest because they know how to read, which is a big deal globally. You know, we, we take that for granted in America and the Western world, but in developing nations, a lot of kids don't know how to read. But because Martin Luther was reformed, here's the, probably one of the greatest things he did, and I'll close with this. He wrote two books, Babylonian Captivity and Addressed to Nobility, where he said that celibacy, the vow to remain single in the Catholic Church, is a doctrine from hell. He said there's no biblical basis for it. Because in Genesis chapter 1, 28, he told us to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. That's his mandate for us to be married and have children. How can we obey that if we are single? All right? So the Catholic Church to this day, and I love the whole church, so I'm not just you know, casting aspersion on them, but if you want to serve God as a priest, as a pastor, you have to be celibate, right? To serve as a nun, you have to be single. He said, number two, he said, all my friends who are priests are compromising. They're hooking up with prostitutes. They have mistresses on the side. And then he started to name the popes who had illegitimate children. He said, this is not natural for a 20-year-old to go into the priesthood at the peak of his hormonal desire to get married, to make, be single. And then all of a sudden, he's uh, committing immorality on the side and living a hypocritical life because God never intended for them to be single. And then he says this, he said, the pastor should be the example for the church. How can we be an example when we don't even have a family because the basic unit of the church is the family. And, you know, and so he said, we need to be able to get married to be an example for the rest of the parishioners. And the final thing he said was is that this is hurting the economy because when you're single, you're just thinking about yourself, just feeding yourself. But when you're married and you have children, you start work towards legacy. 
And he says, if we will allow the pastors to get married, it will improve the economy. And sure enough, it, was, it just brought revival and reformation. The monasteries emptied by the tens of thousands. And to this day, thank God that, Darren, we can be married, right, as pastors. <laughs> and, and the economy. <laughs> the economy. But here's the point. It takes authority to ship a nation like that. And because Martin Luther had that authority, he was able to bring about the Reformation. But we all have authority at different levels. And God raised up Luther to be an apostle. He may not have called himself an apostle, but he was an apostle. Jesus, from the very beginning, picked the apostles of one to disciple nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I'm with you always to the end of the age. Let's all stand up. Father, we thank you so much. We're living the most exciting time in church history. We're amazed at what you're doing. And Lord, on the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, we are speaking a clear word on revival and reformation. That we can't do it without your power in Zechariah 4, 6, but we also know that you're raising up reformers. All of us are reformers in our sphere, whether we're on the family mountain or the business mountain. Lord, we don't want to just see it as a job, 95 thing that we just have to endure, but Lord, it's a ministry that you called for us to bring transformation in our sphere and collectively as we do this, we can see a nation discipled. We can see Roe v. Wade overturned here in our lifetime. We can see and declare uh, the restoration of the family being defined between one man, one woman. And so Lord, I'm believing for all this and more. I pray right now for a corporate impartation of the apostolic that we would be an apostolic people. Uh, Lord, if you use that word intentionally to bring heaven's culture wherever we go. So we make a commitment that we're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, freely we received, freely we're going to give. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you. Listen, I'm going to hang around five, ten minutes to sign some books, and then I have to head for the airport. And so I'll just see you by the book table. Darren, thank you so much for having me. It's just been absolutely awesome. Come on, let's give Papa Jay a big thank you. Hey, just, do, just declare this. Will you just say, I am a reformer. So, Father, show me what you want to do through me. Give me your eyes to see and give me courage to engage. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. God bless you. Have a good lunch. We'll see you tonight with Mahesh Shavda at 7 p.m. Uh, get here early. It's going to be it's going to be full. It's going to be awesome. All right, love you guys.